Hafade and welcome to the 10th annual Guam International Film Festival Grand Jury Panel. I am your moderator, Miracle Mughal. We are joined today by our host, GIF founder and program director, Kel Munya, along with the members of our Grand Jury, Dr. Tom Breslin, Gabrielle Kelly, Kimberly Basford, and D.W. Ferranti. In today's panel, we will collect the thoughts of our jury on the four films that have been voted as this year's GIF Grand Jury honorees, as well as discuss the significance of Indigenous stories in film, which is this year's festival's theme, and finally, the future of film past COVID in terms of education, distributorship, and festivals. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our Grand Jury panel, starting with our head juror, Dr. Tom Breslin in Hawaii. Associate Dean of the College of Arts, Languages and Letters at the University of Hawaii, Professor Breslin's broad media career began in Guam. He received his Master of Arts degree and PhD in Mass Communication and Film at The Ohio State University. His specialty areas include Indigenous Film, Media Ethics, International and Intercultural Journalism and Mass Communication. He was twice a Fulbright Scholar in Germany and has led teaching and research projects in major universities in Japan, China, Paris, and Berlin. Breslin has been a juror for the Hawaii and Shanghai International Film Festivals. He is on the board of advisors for Film by Youth Inside and the editorial board of the journal Visual Communication Quarterly. Next, we have juror Gabrielle Kelly in Virginia. Gabrielle teaches screenwriting for the American Film Institute and a former associate arts professor for New York University, Tisch Asia School of the Arts. Gabrielle's expertise also is rooted in the board of directors for the British Academy of Film and Television and Women in Film and co-founder of the International Alliance of Women Cinematographers. She's a Fulbright Scholar Senior Specialist, Media and Communications, screenwriter and producer of feature and indie films with extensive international industry experience including projects with Paramount Pictures, Columbia Pictures, Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, Marvel Comics, HBO, CBS Film and Television, Cannes Film Festival, and USC School of Cinematic Arts. Up next, we have juror Kimberly Basford, also in Hawaii. Kimberly combines her love for storytelling with her background in journalism to bring the underrepresented stories of girls and women to the world. She directed and produced documentaries for the World Channel, PBS, and HBO Family. Kimberly was a producer in two national PBS documentary series and has garnered numerous honors for her work, including Film Festival Audience Awards and Grand Jury Prizes, a DuPont Columbia Award, Student Academy Award, and Seeing Golden Eagles. Her work has been supported by the Sundance Institute, Women in Film Los Angeles, ITVS, Center for Asian American Media, Pacific Islanders and Communications, and CBP or PBS. Kimberly holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Harvard University and a Master's in Journalism from the University of California, Berkeley. She owns Making Waves Films, LLC, a documentary production company in Honolulu, Hawaii. And final juror, D.W. Ferranti in Los Angeles. Dan studied film in New York University and theater at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Active in the underground theater scene in Boston and later New York, he co-founded Boston's Acme Theater and was a frequent collaborator with the House of Borax where he started producing live netcasts of theater, sketches, and a live rock and roll interview show long before the era of live blogs, podcasts, and YouTube. Much to his surprise, he found himself living in Los Angeles where he has worked on a wide array of projects uniting theater, film, and a digital realm, such as state-of-the-art interactive theatrical campaigns, original comedy shorts, virtual marketing campaigns, and independent feature films, including This Film Is Not Yet Rated for Kirby Dick and Satan Hates You for James Felix McKenney. Dan is a former Warner Brothers home entertainment copywriter and podcaster for the Warner Archive Collection. Thank you all for joining us. We will begin with the GIF Grand Jury Award honoree in the documentary short category, our Atoll Speaks, Kotela Tala Maito Maito Wena, directed by Hema Cubero del Barrio. Dr. Tom, we'll, we'll start with you. Although you have been involved in many films and scholastic programs around the world, giving you insight to many different international perspectives, you've given your professionals or start 
early in your career here in Guam, and to this day, continue to work based in Hawaii. Talk about the film from both a worldview and from the view of someone rooted in the islands. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Miracle. I, I particularly enjoyed all of the uh, documentaries. And, and I have to say that uh, it was a difficult decision, but of course decisions uh, have to be made. Uh, in addition to the indigenous theme of Gift 10, I also found that among the nominees, a very feminist uh, under theme as well. And, and I truly appreciated that. <clears throat> and it was certainly reflected in this documentary short, uh, as well as, as the others that were in competition. My judging standard uh, for uh, a lot of documentaries is, do they give a voice to the voiceless? Do they introduce us to uh, a culture that we don't know? Because one of the important aspects of indigenous film <clears throat> is that it, it allows communication within the culture uh, to, to reinforce, but also uh, gives us a more accurate and authentic representation. And I felt with this particular uh, documentary, it achieved that extremely well. Would anyone care to add to that? Um, um, and I didn't wait three seconds, I apologize. Uh, I was really glad Tom brought up the, the feminist undercurrent with, with the nominees. I mean, is every year there's always something that strikes me about the group of, of entrance and, and you start to see these unconscious zeitgeist threads. And, and this year there was this sort of dueling. I mean, the indigenous people's story thing was very important across the board, but there was also this sort of dueling theme of, of the, the feminist theme and the, the, the fight to preserve culture and, and the sort of dynamic of like the voice of the women emerging to try to save the culture while their own positions in society are changing and being questioned. I mean, it was sort of like across the board as I'm watching all these films, I was just like, you know, there really is something going on. And, um, and also just about, this film, uh, you know, just historically going back, like Kel and I talking about film 10, 15 years ago with, with as, as technology changed and the tools to make film became more accessible. I mean, we used to talk about it's like the new typewriter, you know, once everybody could get a typewriter and a printing press, world storytelling opened up. And now, you know, we were we're out there with our DV cameras, and now between the uh, the drone footage and the and the the HD cinematography in this film, I mean, it's beautiful, and you can tell that you know these these are these are DIY filmmakers who are making something that is absolutely professional, beautiful quality that you can't you know. There's no like pat on the back, keep trying, guys. This was a really, really, really well made film, and. I, I would love to jump in there as well, sort of on the theme of indigenous filmmaking. I mean, one of the issues always is, you know, looking at the history of sort of anthropological films is sort of the outsider, sort of this extractive filmmaking where someone comes in and tells the story of the people there. And what I love about this film, it feels like it really was a partnership because they use the communal poems of of the people from Puka Puka. And then I believe the narrator was Johnny Frisbee, who was from that place. Um, and, and then, I mean, I believe the filmmaker is not, but she, it was a real partnership, it felt like, and it felt like it wasn't, you know, someone from the outside telling a story, but using the words of the people there and, and really kind of in a partnership in telling their story. So I really appreciated that about this film. It was, it was indeed just a very beautiful poetic piece and just before I saw it and I actually ended up seeing it three times um, I someone asked me um, why are all these nature films the, the narrator is always male and I had never actually thought about that but then I I started think I just seen 
the documentary film My Octopus Teacher. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen that. Um, but it was so, you know, it was so interesting, as you said, Kimberly, this voice, not just of the people rather than something being imposed, but the narrator being a woman. And then I also love, because I always watch films to the very last frame. Um, and I found actually some friends on some of the film, different films that we, we were judging. Uh, but I loved seeing that every single person um, on this at all was, was listed who was part of it. All the men and women and children, name by name. And I just found that very, I found it was so, sort of a return to something very elemental. And that, as you have said earlier, um, fellow jurors who've commented on this, we're in such a terrible crisis. And when I saw that shot, you know, moving towards the atoll, uh, I think if you're sitting in LA or here, I'm sitting in Virginia or wherever you are in the world, you just feel a lot of grief and incredible responsibility for where we are at this really challenging time. Next up, we have A Fear, directed by Oliver Collet and Alexandre Berman, the GIFT Grand Jury Award honoree in the documentary feature category. Ms. Gabrielle, like your fellow panelists, you're an educator whose involvement in Pacific Asian film organizations and festivals and overall knowledge is thoroughly extensive. How did this film resonate with you? Um, it's, it's just really a, a, an, an incredible, film, um, you know, it's a, it's all sort of played out like a Greek tragedy. And in terms of my background and spending so many years living in, in Asia and working with other initiatives, particularly, I myself am not a documentary filmmaker. I'm a screenwriter of narrative films and a producer primarily of narrative films. But I'm finding documentary more and more such a powerful uh, genre. And it's not the one I've really been working in so much. But this was almost, um, as I say, I, I kept thinking of a Greek tragedy as this unfolded. And it's, it's a story that we've seen, sadly, in so many other iterations. But I don't, I've never, I uh, didn't know anything about Bougainville Island. And so just um, hearing this, you know, sort of seeing the story and feeling, please don't let it end this way, but feeling there was a kind of inevitability um, was, you know, it was both actually profoundly upsetting, but also as a, an, someone mentioned earlier, what a, what a high standard of production and storytelling. You know, because as a narrative filmmaker, I'm, I'm very interested in the story that you, of course, have to have in a documentary. And how do you, you know, how do you reach that? How do you get to it? Um, and yes, I mean, history continues to repeat itself. But I think the, the fact that we're hearing this story through, again, the people who are there themselves so eloquently it really agitates and, and educates and shows us that we haven't come so very far. We have a lot further to go. Would anyone else like to add to that? Well, let me uh, just just say, I also found in the, the, the film, uh, certainly an, an indictment of colonialism, but presented in a way of, uh, not so much the the evil overlords. Um, you know, it it did recognize that there was a very misguided intention of trying to do some good, of of trying to bring some modernity to to Bougainville, but in a way that was not respective of of the culture, and in fact destructive of the of the culture. Douglas Oliver, the anthropologist who was quoted throughout the film, of course, spent 
many of his years here at the University of, of Hawaii and is quite well known for his anthropological uh, studies of Pacific Islands. And I don't think that um, what he was describing, he intended to be used uh, for the, the effects uh, that, it, that it was. And what was very powerful about this documentary, again, with a, <clears throat> excuse me, a very feminist overtone, was it explained what's what's worth preserving? What are the issues uh, uh, here? So I, I thought it was extremely educational uh, in in that regard, and the basic premise that a culture should be able to make its own decisions about its own future. So it's it's kind of a poster child for decolonization. So I also thought it was in some ways a very ambitious film to tell the story of, of a place, a community, and you know, in, in terms of history and how, how things have changed. Um, and so it was, but I also thought, so I'm a documentary filmmaker myself, and I actually thought they really pulled off a good balance between having to give a lot of context and information because most of the people who, who see this film are not gonna know anything or very little about Bougainville, just like myself. Um, and so I had to learn a lot. I mean, it was a lot that I had to take in to sort of understand the history. Um, but it was also just a very beautiful piece of filmmaking. You know, there were characters. I was, I really remarked one of the notes I made was on the strong use of music and sound design. Um, and, and so, you know, the mix of the storytelling and the story itself, I thought they did a really great job. I mean, there's just so much, there's archival footage, there's verite, um, there's, you know, they took pieces of, of, I guess, like some of the indigenous stories and interwove it all into this kind of very beautiful tapestry. Um, and so I, as a documentarian, I was very impressed at how everything really came together. And I just wanted to learn more. I mean, after I watched the film, I, I Googled um, about the place and I, I just wanted to learn more. And I think that's what a good documentary does. It gets their audience interested um, in, a, in a world and a character and wants you to learn more about it, even after. Yeah, I mean, uh, echoing uh, what, what Tom said uh, and Gabriel, uh, the, uh, for me, I mean, I didn't know about Bougainville and there's a lot to know. And it's shocking uh, when you watch this, uh, you know, you're just left with how much do we still not know? And then, yeah, you do the Googling, you start reading and you're, you're, I mean, I was just, as I was watching the film, I was like, you know, this was happening in the nineties and got no coverage over here. And, you know, these were people fighting for their own self-determination. I mean, this is, and this is a story that plays out over and over and over again. And, as usual, it gets ignored. Um, but then also just the skillfulness of the documentarians and how they told the story in that like the modern, in how they deploy the exposition because there's a lot of information that they need to get across to people because this is a story that hasn't been told and, and the thoughtfulness of using, letting them tell their own stories in the present day with exposition and then the use of archival footage and the anthropologist report and the the industrial footage from the mining corporation to sort of tell the past in the voices of the powers of the past but let the present be told from from their perspective just as a <clears throat> side note uh the the sections on how the mining companies created their own communities uh with company stores company housing uh, was, was uh, so reflective of the plantation era in, in Hawaii. And anyone who sees this may have a better understanding of how spam and canned corned beef uh, has, has become so prevalent throughout the, the Pacific Islands. Thank you for your responses. Um, next, we have the Gift Grand Jury Award honoree in the narrative short category. Nina, directed by Christo Simonov of Bulgaria. Dan, we will start with you. I thought it was great. I mean, this was just, I mean, um, narrative short fiction is always tough. I mean, it's like, 
it's like a short story. It's it's the true art of storytelling. And and there there is so much packed in a short time, and yet still at the end of this film, I was just left with what. Let me rephrase this. I understand why it ended where it ended and there's nothing wrong with the storytelling because it's a complete story, but I still wanted to stay longer in that world. And, and with Nina and her choices and the choices she was making and why she was making them. Uh, and I just thought, you know, uh, there, was, there was many, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the film in, inhabits this world that we don't understand and yet we do understand because it's part of the Western world, yet it's still part of the yeah. unknown. Uh, and there's a displaced person at the heart of it and how she's trying to get by. And then, you know, tried and true storytelling stuff, just, just the relationship with the stray dog. It, 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 I mean, there's so much that's happening in this film in what, 10 minutes? And then just the the ending as it does, not, not to spoil it for people, because you should watch it before you watch this panel, but the the extended shot of her shaving, uh, Nina shaving Vasily, and both the power and the vulnerability and the control that's going on in that scene, which really sums up like, oh, this is why she's staying. And what an incredible actress, that young Nina, the young woman who plays Nina, just you know, because it was not dialogue heavy. It was very, yeah. much, you know, let's show, not tell. And that actually looking at a lot of short films, well, whether they're short or feature, but particularly in shorts, I find because they're short, they're often very dialogue and exposition heavy. And it's, you know, this story really was, was not. Um, so you really, actually could see how amazing she was. And it's not easy to work with younger kids, you know. And I don't know if she's trained or not, but she she was really something, you know. Again, I also, I, I love to see, because others have mentioned it, uh, you know, this young woman at the center of the story. Um, it's very nuanced, it's very subtle. But it's about her, and it's named after her, too. The other thing I was going to maybe add to what Gabrielle said, you know, we're talking about these films having a very strong feminist bend this year. And it's about her, and her performance was amazing. Um, but also the relationship with the, the other woman in the film, you know, the person she, was, she stole from, that was really fascinating to me, and how the woman, of course, was really trying to trying to help her. And again, I don't want to go into too many details because people should watch it, but I just found their relationship really interesting. And as I was watching it, trying to kind of see it from both both perspectives on what each was trying to kind of achieve and, and get from the other um, was interesting. Um, and I, overall, I just found it a very intriguing film, you know, from the very beginning and just seeing this world and a lot of the things were left very kind of open-ended. I mean, you know, there's the dog, but there's really just that one scene. And I was still trying to figure out what her relationship w with, with that man was. I mean, there was so much that was kind of left unsaid, but I was there. I, I was just kind of was kept wanting to find out more. And so I thought that they did really a really good job in terms of the storytelling and really hooking the viewer because I was hooked the whole time. I've, I've done uh, some some writing on the films of, Christopher Nolan, and one of the reasons I like him as a filmmaker so much is that the film continues after you leave the theater. Uh, the, the story doesn't end, and, and it continues to unspool in your mind. And I felt that way about this film. And, and one of the reasons I like a lot of the European shorts is that they're not the three-act uh, character arc crammed into somewhere between eight and, and 14 minutes, <clears throat> that, it, that it can continue. Uh, what happens to her? Well, you know, I, I think if we asked all of us, we'd probably come up with different answers uh, for, for each of us. And that's, that's a true value of a, of a film. So it, when you stream it, I, I hope it's the last one streamed so that people will have the opportunity to 
think about it as they uh, as they go to bed at night and not have to uh, then immediately segue into another film. Thank you for your answers and your um, and your responses. And finally, we have the GIF Grand Jury Award honoree in the narrative feature category from Indonesia, Sugar on the Weaver's Chair, directed by Harvan Augustrian Sira. Kimberly, with your past works and background in the focus of representation of women in film, please share your thoughts. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this was right on my alley because most of the films I've done are about women's stories. And first of all, I was just, I, I, would, I applaud them too for, you know, they, they had interweaving stories. So that was what was really interesting to me about this film. Uh, three interweaving storylines, really all about sort of gender equality at the heart of them, um, but they don't they don't necessarily intersect. Um, and it was really interesting to see um, because each one was very different. You know, you had one storyline was really about you know a wife and a husband and sort of negotiating um, power and, and dynamics like that. Then you have another one where it's you know a woman and her father, and then the third one was you know a woman a group of women really. Um, and so I liked how just kind of they looked at it from different you know, points of views and, and had these storylines kind of come in and out. Um, and I also just really love the sense of place. I've never been to Indonesia, but um, I felt like the, the way that they edited the film and the sort of the pacing, sort of you got a really good sense of the, the daily life there. And it was, it was a bit of a slower pacing, but it really worked. And it really made me feel like I was, I was there and I had a really, strong sense of what what these women's lives were like so I, I thought I really enjoyed that film yeah that that was a wonderful um explication of of the film Kimberly it's I've actually spent quite a lot of time in Indonesia and it's one of it's just first of all it's so many different uh places and it has so many you know from Jakarta to it's a completely different from Jogjakarta, and there's so many different stories. It's it has so many millions of people. I mean, it is really um, kind of just totally overwhelming. It's full of story, um, and I'm actually working on an Indonesian project right now with a screenwriter as a co-writer. So I've been very immersed in rethinking about a time I spent in Indonesia. And what's very striking here is I, it's not easy to tell women's stories, not so easy in Indonesia to tell these stories, but there are extraordinary and remarkable uh, directors and writers, women who are coming out of Indonesia and really you know, make, making waves in festivals like Guam and also other co-production labs and so forth that I work in. Um, so it's a, it's a very complex society and to tackle this, and as you said, Kimberly, these stories, they, they we interweave, but they don't really, they, or they almost are parallel. Um, you know, and actually it's a challenge that uh, I was very familiar with in a project I did that involved Indonesia that was 10 short films made through ASEAN. And Indonesia was one of the countries, and then we had to cut them together into a feature film like an omnibus and the theme was rice um, and of all the uh, entries the one from Indonesia was um, you know it seemed like it would be maybe a very circumscribed story and it was actually very radical and that that is sort of my sense of the country um, a very complex country so I you know I, I feel humble in my understanding of it but it's it's just fascinating. And I, I felt a lot of um, hope actually in seeing this film. I'm very happy it won because its message is like extremely powerful for women, not just in Indonesia, but, you know, but worldwide. But it isn't a country that's maybe so well known. So again, I'm, I'm really happy people will be seeing it um, and learn more about those those three stories and and they're thereby what's going on in this part of the world that we can also relate to too as women you know in the west i would i certainly second that and and i think this could be a textbook 
film <clears throat> to be used at the University of Hawaii or the University of Guam or University of South Pacific of how you can tell authentic local stories that have universal appeal. Because each of these three stories, interweaving or, or parallel, I guess they, they never quite intersect, but they certainly do in, in our mind. They each involve universal themes that are, that are relatable. And it's not the kind of film I think that you would turn off just because it's subtitled, because yeah. you'll recognize in it uh, the, the, the conditions and, and themes that appeal on a very broad uh, global basis. Yeah, I think the, the confidence of the uh, direction in that, you know, these three parallel storylines are, are three different genres. I mean, there is, there is a domestic tragedy that resolves. There, there is a coming of age story. And then there's, there's a workplace comedy that is actually really engaging in the way the film very deftly jumps between each of these narratives. It's never jarring. You're always there, but you'll have a really heavy moment with, with, the, with Tree and the, sh and the sh dealing with her husband's paralysis and the sugar. And then we'll, we'll jump to the weavers while they're harassing that poor teacher and it's light and you're, you're engaged. And there's no, there's no sense of something being off. All the films complement each other, but they truly are three different genres, all telling the same story of like women rising above their, their cultural circumstances to make an important change. Also, this was every year I tell Kel, there's, there's a film that makes me cry. And sometimes it's a very sad cry, but this one was a very happy cry that just the, the, the final end with her climbing the tree is such a simple yet truly like this is bravura filmmaking, but it's all set up and we all get there honestly. Okay, so now let's open the floor to the importance of continuing indigenous stories to film. If you each can chime in and give us your thoughts on the subject. Tom, let's start with you. Well, I people may be tired of of hearing me uh, say it, but you know, if, again, if we don't tell our own stories, who will? <clears throat> we've we've had too much of a film history <clears throat> of stories being told to people and for people rather than uh, those peoples, in indigenous peoples, telling their own stories. And that's uh, as as you said, I. My professional experience uh, began on Guam, and what attracted me uh, back was uh, the Munya's Shiro's head, because here was a Guam story uh, told by uh, by Chamorros in the in the language, uh, and it was great because again it it was a it had themes that resonated. Uh, beyond the islands, but it also uh, had this amazing uh, effect within Guam of, of kind of bonding of, wow, here we are. Uh, we're up there on the screen in, uh, in our own language, uh, in, in our own geography, in our own sense of place. And the number of films that have uh, come from that, have been inspired by that is just truly amazing and, and is reflected uh, in, in this festival uh, as well. And when I look at the kinds of films that are coming out of the high school students on Guam and the high school students on Saipan, uh, especially with the We Drank Our Tears series, a little plug uh, for, for those films uh, in, the, in the festival. Uh, is is just amazing. It it makes me feel like uh, the future indeed is bright. Well, I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, so I I completely agree with Tom, and I think you know the Guam International Film Festival is is so wonderful that it's a platform for indigenous stories and films. And and for sure, I feel like we need more more of these. And I'm I'm going to maybe just kind of talk a little bit though from the other side because I am not indigenous although I'm you know minority and I think part of my responsibility is to 
to leave, you know, to have, have room for those indigenous filmmakers to tell their story. So I feel like, you know, when I think about film projects, I'm always thinking, should I be the one to tell this story or should this be someone else telling it? And, and often when it comes to Native Hawaiian stories, I step aside because I don't feel like it's my story to tell. And there are wonderful Native Hawaiian filmmakers who should be telling those stories. And so I think for those of us who are not indigenous, I mean, this is a discussion we need to be part of, but we need to you know, let them lead or figure out ways we can partner or collaborate and also hold them up, which is why I really loved you know, the RFL Speaks because I thought that was a really great collaboration. But um, I mean, I think, I think we need to bring up the indigenous filmmakers and, and show that we value their stories. And then for those of us who are not, we really need to also, you know, leave space for them to tell their stories and figure out how we can support that. So I think it's, you know, everyone needs to be involved in promoting indigenous filmmaking. I think these voices, um, you know, the, it, it, coming from, uh, coming from a place of teaching, uh, I, I actually teach at AFI in Los Angeles, and I've also worked at NYU. And so this landscape of sort of North American or, you know, and European film programs and the film world, uh, they are also having, I think worldwide, we're having a conversation about who speaks, who tells stories. Um, you know, now there's a very strong uh, Native American feature lab, you know, both for television and film in LA. And although there's a lot that isn't happening, um, I feel like a lot of filmmakers I met who no one in the West had heard of in the time I was living there um, and uh, working, for example, on a film in Myanmar, there are not many films that come out of there. Um, and are ever even seen in the West, but it has quite a history of, of filmmaking. And, and sometimes when I'm toggling between like Myanmar and Indonesia and LA, uh, one day I was particularly struck that, you know, the struggle to, to have your own voice, women in particular, because that's something I'm very committed to and it's very much a part of my work. It's the same, it's going on even in, the Hollywood industry, you know, that appropriated a lot of stories and told them. But now, you know, it's just not, it doesn't quite work so easily to just appropriate, appropriate them and not think about where they came from. Um, so it's not just, um, you know, communities that very few people may have heard of, like Bougainville. Um, it, it's, it's also kind of maybe sh turning a mirror to perhaps, you know, America about communities they themselves don't understand, don't know, and the people in them and their lives have not, they haven't really been able to give voice to them. You know, because it's always sort of like, we have a lot to teach if we're experts and have access to a lot of equipment and resources, but I've always, I really found, you know, just a tremendous amount to learn whenever I've been in these, working in other communities, because they've been doing lots of things and been thinking about it a lot longer than I have. Um, so this is why I've always loved this festival so much, Kel, you know, I, I almost got there once, I was in Manila, and, uh, and then Kel said to me, well, I think you're, how far is it, Kel? Is it five hours or 10 hours or something? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's about four hours away. I know, I, that's it. I thought it was like an hour or something and Kel said, no, I think it's about five hours. But I was really close. One day I'm gonna make it because I just love, and I, I talk a lot in a lot of my classes about this festival. And, and just talking about filmmakers, you know, that you would never hear of and giving students, you know, the names of the films and resources as a resource to, you know, really, I remember one year there was an incredible film about a woman, a midwife in some Pacific Island community. And I shared that and a number of my students looked at it and just said, wow, you know, we would, but of course, actually you always do come back a lot to distribution, right? And how you can see these films, how, how can they get a wider audience? But festivals like, um, you know, like this just 
a tremendous in in getting all of us together to talk about what we love and what we've learned and and also showcasing these stories for the filmmakers yeah i'd have to say you know getting back to earlier referencing conversations i had with kel and don about how the tools for filmmaking were suddenly accessible to everyone and you know, uh, uh, back in the aughts, we had fantasies of this sudden democratization, small d, of world storytelling. And, and it wasn't just going to be the West and it wasn't just going to be Hollywood. It was everyone was it was just going to be the story. And, and we were going to hear and read and experience stories from people all over the world. But and, and a lot of that has happened. It's happened much more slowly than I naively thought. But one of the issues was distribution. Like uh, uh, being a juror on something like, like GIF is, uh, is, is a real treat because uh, m much like my one time uh, at Sundance uh, for a documentary, I saw so many films I never would have seen before or since. And, and those are the films that stuck with me. Not, not the films that broke out and got somebody a big, the, the, like a the small Chinese film about a kindergarten kid. Uh, and, and now sort of this weird, um, as this worldwide global health crisis has forced the industry to change how it distributes, we're suddenly looking at an accelerated model where uh, stories are no longer hampered by, well, we need to get it into the multiplex. People are now readily consuming and getting used to watching stuff online, which was always sort of like, oh, thanks to the internet, we're all going to expose, but eh, not really. But now habits are changing and as habits changing, uh, stories are being experienced and, and, uh, the the more gifts the better lastly as you're all educators on the panel let's discuss your thoughts on the future of film past covid in terms of education distributorship and films or well, film festivals um tom gabrielle and kimberly can we have your thoughts on film education past covid dan on distributorship past covid and then cal regarding festivals i was talking with one of our um uh, acting professors in the in the theater department, <clears throat> how I noticed in in some television and, and print ads where the the person is wearing a mask, how much uh, of the message has to come from the eyes, <clears throat> and how important uh, uh, it is to to be able to show emotion and even even cognition through the eyes. And, and we had a very interesting discussion of should films, should we pretend that COVID doesn't exist and go ahead and, and make films with uh, unmasked, undistanced actors? Or should we, do we have an obligation to document the times and show that uh, it, it did happen and it affected not only public health but all socialization and entertainment and and film uh as well so it's it's hard it's hard to predict post covid because who knows when the post is going to happen uh how how long it's going to be with us so i'm more focused right now in let's not just be impatient for it all to be over so that we can go back to some semblance of, of normal, um, kind of a, a nostalgia. And with all nostalgia, it's usually for times that didn't really exist, but were, were just uh, the fonder elements of our, of our memory. Actually, uh, Kimberly's students, I think, did a a fantastic collection of, of films that dealt with the earlier days of the of the pandemic and how interaction occurred and, and how interactions uh, weren't able to occur and how the actors uh, the, the student actors reacted uh, to that uh, and and again as 
as, as we've discussed, the distribution system is definitely shifting and we're seeing uh, major films being released uh, uh, in, in streaming uh, without being released in, in theaters. And uh, for, for some studios, the holding back on releasing of, of some films until next year may actually work against them. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Again, if I were able to predict the future, I wouldn't be working <clears throat> as a university professor. <laughs> I'd be making a whole lot more money uh, uh, someplace else. But the idea of, of streaming festivals <clears throat> and the fact that, I mean, it's wonderful that, that GIF is, is streaming at no cost, but I've noticed that in other national and international festivals that are going to streaming, the cost uh, for seeing blocks of films has been reduced, which is going to make them more, uh, more accessible. And I and I think that's that's very important, and that perhaps this platform will indeed democratize uh, filmmaking and and film distribution a little more. I've run out of things to say. Yeah, I, 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 think absolutely. I think it really will. And I was struck the other day by thinking about since the beginning of film. You know, uh, first of all, when um, when there was sound, you know, so many people couldn't go on acting, you know, because they had, they had sort of a squeaky voice. It didn't translate and it was a huge shakeup. And then in the event of television, that also was, you know, people were saying films will never, I mean, there were many statements made about how this would just be the end of this and that and, t you know, or, or that, uh, you know, television would just fade and die away. But we in the world have never experienced a pandemic that is worldwide. And as it affects everything, I think it, it definitely affects, um, as, you, as you were saying, Tom, it, many ideas about the way things have to be are just not true. You know, so Christopher Nolan did hold back his film as long as he could, but eventually I saw that film in a drive-in in a town of about 200 people. Um, and it was quite an incredible experience to see it on a rather small screen because he wouldn't allow it, he would only allow it to be shown where there was an actual theater. So although this was a drive-in, there was a theater next to it which I didn't want to go into because I, I didn't want to, I'd rather see it in the drive-in. Um, and there were many things you could say about seeing a film like that, that the director very much wanted seen in a specific way. So we don't have any choice about a lot of change um, in terms of, I think, particularly distribution. You know, the cost of releasing a film in a theater and questions like, will the experience of going to a movie theater go away? I don't think it will, but I think we're, we're heading in, we will head into as we can do things again that we're not able to do now. We won't be going back. We'll be going forward to, to an unknown landscape actually, where we can take some experiences with us. But in a way it allows, as you said, it allows an opening for example, with festivals, so many people can't go to them and that they've now been able to attend or attend some of the panels or so on and so forth. So it has really opened up, but I don't think anything will ever, um, nothing is as wonderful as like being with people if we were all together in person and whoever is watching this, if we were all together with you, we would love to be there, you know, eating and drinking and talking and staying late and talking about film. I think that we'll be doing that again. And so we'll, we, but we have a chance to look at how things can be done differently. And I hope better, you know, because it's not a choice to change. We, we, we have to change. And, and also you asked uh, Miracle about education. 
um, we're trying to shoot at AFI, the directors are trying to shoot, we have some ability to shoot, you know, in person, although that changes, you know, according to health guidelines and so forth. But it is, it's very challenging to learn cinematography or directing. Like I work in the screenwriting department and while that is easier in a way, you st there's still a loss of like the communality of working together in person. Um, I, and I think also maybe more will be available online in education, something people have talked about, but we haven't really had to do it so much. I've just recently, in the last four months, I've had to take a, a project that I run, which is a pitch fest for graduating screenwriters that's usually held in person with, you know, managers and agents where they would meet these industry people and pitch their projects and take it online. So Miracle, I'm very sympathetic to you. You know, uh, technically doing these things is like incredibly difficult and it's happening this week actually on Wednesday. But on the other hand, we've gone from 50 guests to 3,725, I think. So, you know, you just kind of go, well, it's, you know, we lost uh, some things about being in person, but potentially we're reaching so many more people we would never have reached. So I, I'm excited, like sometimes you get worn down by all of this, but uh, it's here and we all have to find a way of dealing with it. So I want it to be better when we can get together again in person. I want to have learned from this my fellow panelists have been so eloquent in their their thoughts and i agree with with many of them um in terms of education you know i i do teach filmmaking here in hawaii and we've obviously had to pivot a lot going online but i think you know for my students it it really forced them to be creative and to be to be resourceful um to be flexible and you know, for the most part, most of them are doing documentaries, not all of them. And I think documentarians in general know how to be resourceful and kind of just have to go with where the story is and go with what your constraints are. So they they rose to the challenge. And, and it was it was great experience for them to kind of have a, you know, figure out how they can contribute to documenting this moment, right? This moment in time. And there are going to be many, many stories about, about this moment in COVID. Um, Speaking in terms of, you know, the future, I, I agree with everything Gabrielle said. Um, you know, I, I think everything going online, you obviously lose the intimacy of being in person and sort of the things that happen after the screening, getting to meet people and talking and, and that I sort of miss, you know, we have this the Zoom panel and then we'll all go off to our separate lives. But um, what, what we get in return is accessibility, right? That sense of, you know, I've in these, I don't know, seven months, I've had so many, gone to so many webinars, I've been able to go to conferences that I would have normally had to travel to, or I wouldn't have gone because of the travel issue. And so, and a lot of them have been free or reduced costs. And so I feel like I've been able to do a lot of professional development in this time, just myself, you know, seeing a lot of films, uh, hearing a lot of panels, and, um, and my students too can access things that they definitely would not have been able to access before. So I hope that continues or some part of that and you know film festivals will continue having some things that are are open to you know the broader global public um, in addition to having their festivals but I guess we'll just have to see what what happens and how things unfold yeah ideally you know uh, the, in the future well well for one thing you know since there's always you know a, a one to two year lag in storytelling in GIF 13, we'll be seeing the films about now, and we'll see the first crop of COVID filmmaking. But the other thing is, you know, hold on to the expanded accessibility and then bring back the, the excitement of the live interaction and the people and, and, and the interaction both with each other and the people, but still keep it accessible and keep it open so, you know, like I just, the fact that you guys are going to be able to stream this through the PBS streaming, I mean, way more people are going to see these films yeah. than we're able to see the previous entries. So hold on to that, but then 
bring back the live element because people are also are going to be excited and that excitement actually does translate even across the internet absolutely um from the film festival standpoint it's definitely been a learning experience just when i thought i was getting you know a sense of how to how to negotiate the film festival from from a programmer's perspective um, I got thrown for a loop, but I've, I've definitely learned a lot. As uh, COVID started um, emerging early on this year, um, I think it threw many festivals for a loop. We were all kind of just watching each other and communicating with each other and trying to figure out what direction we're going to decide to choose. Um, for Guam, it's, it's, it's kind of unique because Although we're an international hub, we're very localized. And like what Gabrielle said, the communal aspect of GIF is our strong point. However, just you know, on, the, on the other side of the, the coin there, what Kimberly had mentioned is the accessibility. This is the first time I've seen all of you no. at one, you know, in, in one place in time. And so there is something valuable there. Um, what I've learned, I guess, um, and then and from this experience and then taking it into account for, yeah, GIF uh, 11 and so forth, is working with the distributors, the agents, even down to the independent filmmakers themselves, because Dan, as we were talking about earlier before the panel had started, um, there were a lot of filmmakers that were initially apprehensive about signing on to a festival that will go online worldwide with no geo restrictions and it's going to be streamed um so the this is a, a time for the collaboration in a sense of not only the festivals but the festivals and the filmmakers and the agents and distributors to figure out what their true intent is with their content mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is, is it's really forcing, even uh, from our perspective as a festival, it's forcing us to really take a look at our mission and decide on, okay, we have these three prongs um, of community entertainment education in our mission. However, because of limited resources, uh, being able to um, cater to our audience in a new medium or, you know, just uh, emphasize the medium of, of going online versus in a theater, it really forces us into the position of trying to get down to the nuts and bolts of what it is we're trying to do with the festival. So that was great to be more of an, uh, taking more of an introspective perspective on that. And then for the filmmaker, this year we've had our, our fastest call for entries in a two day span. Um, which was over 800 films. And we had to pause the submissions process early because you know, we're at a limited staff right now. And there was no way that we could maintain that, um, that momentum. And being that as it was, it, was, um, it really took us into um, the ability of, of discovering that these filmmakers are hungry they, they need an audience, they need their stories to be exposed. But then at the same time, they're going to have to identify which outlet is going to best suit them and their story, which has always been the case, yeah? Um, whether you're talking top tier film market festivals down to communal festivals, um, except this time they're just thrusted faster into that uh, method of thinking, which is what is it really that I'm trying to do with this film? And that is, I think, where we are now, is, is um, embracing that thought and that idea um, of what it means to be you as a filmmaker or, or myself as a programmer and then finding that connection. Because it's online, there's, you know, you'll have uh, basically, I guess, every festival now looking at the possibility of going online if they haven't already. However, it will be more finely tuned to fit both the festival and uh, the filmmaker in delivering their stories to the right people. Yeah. And if the festival, the 
for the for the um, you know the filmmaker, they always uh, hope for exposure. You know, for the audience, for the the Q and A to meet people uh, to connect. But the thing is, it's you know, except for the festivals that are in the space of markets, like uh, distribution markets or labs. And these are the bigger festivals that are, you know, very well funded or have a lot of sponsors. Um, you know, it, it, those, I mean, those are not very many festivals and we all know them. The ones where distri distributors or sales agents go and deals are made, the Toronto's kind of, uh, you know, Tribeca, whatever. So that, you know, those, that's not most festivals. That's about nine festivals. Um, and so what you're saying, Kel, is that I think there is a possibility if what the filmmaker wants is that exposure and really just anyone who would uh, have a real, you know, passion, uh, commitment, but also the bottom line is, you know, someone who could see a film and find a way to distribute it in some way. Um, at least now, you, uh, if you're not a big festival with lots of money, you, you can get a wider exposure or you can have the filmmaker, you know, do a lot more when, as you say, you're streaming all these films. I mean, yes, they're worried about um, piracy or whatever, et cetera. That's completely understandable, but it, it's always been very difficult in the festival world um, when you're not the big festivals with huge sponsors and then people can come physically to those festivals who could sign a filmmaker or buy rights. When you're a festival that doesn't have that going on, and it's not the goal of many festivals, but really for the filmmakers, what all filmmakers want that audience. And the thing is, there are so many films and it's expensive to find the audience for the film, hence streaming, which we didn't even mention, although we're like sitting watching, you know, net, it seems like everyone is watching Netflix around the clock. Um, you know, so I do think there's something there that is, I don't know what it is yet, because as we're all saying, we're kind of feeling this out, but, um, you know, definitely, the extreme nature of the festival world where it's sort of all loaded towards very big festivals that have a lot of resources but huge budgets and then other much more bespoke you know the the thousands of festivals that are about very specific subjects but all of those filmmakers want to find an audience and that's why they love it when they hear that they've been accepted in the festival or one and, and winning is, as we know, as us educators, you know, that is a huge deal for, for filmmakers making their way to be awarded and recognized. That can, that can really boost your spirits in very low moments, you know, to go on, right? And say, you know, I'm just gonna keep going because it's, it's difficult to all you filmmakers out there, keep going. Well, it's been a pleasure to finally see all of you in one space, especially for me, even though it's virtually. Um, we're so grateful that you were able to make time to grace us in the panel. Would any of you like to share any closing remarks for the festival and our viewers? I hope we get to be together. Well, it's been a pleasure to finally see all of you in one space, especially for me, even though it's virtually. Um, we're so grateful that you were able to make time to grace us in the panel. Would any of you like to share any closing remarks for the festival and our viewers? I hope we get to be together um, very soon, as soon as possible, where we can all, you know, sit together and have a have a drink and a meal and celebrate how wonderful this marvelous festival is. Absolutely. Here, 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 here. And thank Definitely. you, Phil. Thank you. I wish it was yeah. something stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say um, on behalf, again, on behalf of everyone involved um, with GIF from year one all the way up till now, 
Uh, thank you all so much for being so supportive and seeing the promise and the vision um, in the festival before it was even fully uh, conceptualized. Um, we truly appreciate all of the guidance and expertise and, and education that, that you've contributed towards the direction all the way up until the 10th year and hopefully for many more years to come. Um, I do wholeheartedly um, would love to be in the same physical space with all of you. So that's something definitely for us to look forward to in the future. Um, and yeah, I, I can't express uh, the gratitude enough. Thank you all so very much for being a part of GIF for so many years. Thank you. And I would say congratulations to all the winners. Yes. Yes. And for our jurors, Dr. Tom Breslin, Gabrielle Kelly, Kimberly Basford, and D.W. Ferranti, along with GIF founder Kel Munya, I'm Miracle Mogul, wishing you all the best. Suzuis Maasi, and thank you for watching. Stay safe, and from the comfort of wherever you are, log on to pbsguam.org or wallfilmfestival.org and enjoy the free live streaming worldwide on PBS Guam's YouTube channel of the 10th Annual Guam Film Festival. Back, I look at the